Iran is on, is Iran? Okay. Uh, I'd like to uh, bring the uh, Board of Trustees meeting for June 25, 2013 to order. The board met in closed session and we voted to adopt discipline charges and enter into an agreement to resolve the disciplinary charges against an, an academic employee, ID number 00016833 in return for a waiver of the employee's right to appeal. Okay, now if I can please uh, have Karen, Karen Kane, if she can please uh, lead us in the flag salute, get this meeting started. Thank you. I also uh, just want to note that uh, Trustee Kellogg is uh, traveling, so he will not be in the meeting today. And I'd also like to extend a welcome to Phyllis Arias, who will be joining us now in the days as the representative for the Academic Senate. Welcome, Phyllis. Phyllis and I go way back, and I will not talk about it, not today. Phyllis and I go way back. You go way back. Um, going down to the agenda. Um, roll call, please. Present. Vice President Kellogg, absent. Member Bowen? Here. Member Kellogg? Oh, Member Clark, excuse Here. me. <laughs> Member Otto? Here. And student Trustee Donato? Okay, yeah. uh, President Superintendent uh, Oakley, do we have any welcome and introductions you would like to make? Uh, yes, we do. Um, as, uh, as has been the practice the last couple of months, we have been honoring several retirees. We are going to honor a few more this evening. Um, I know some of them are here today. Uh, so uh, let me begin with um, Mr. Uh, Stephen Aston. Is Steve here? There he is. Steve has been the uh, Performing Arts Production Manager here at Long Beach City College uh, and uh, has served us for 30 great years. Um, obviously been involved in a lot of wonderful productions here at Long Beach City College and uh, has worked with our students throughout. So uh, please join me in recognizing and congratulating Steve on his retirement. <laughs> and. Uh, Steve, as a small token, uh, please uh, let me present to you this certificate from the board recognizing your service. <laughs> I'm a man of few words. Um, no, I have to thank Long Beach City College for giving me a place to do what I do best and love most. Well, thank you. Okay, uh, next we have uh, an individual who has worked with literally, I, I've got to say hundreds of thousands of students at this point. Uh, uh, she has patiently supported our students for many, many years, providing them the financial assistance that they need to succeed here at Long Beach City College. Long Beach City College, uh, year in, year out, has one of the largest uh, financial aid uh, programs in the state. And our success is due to people like Dorothy Gutierrez, 
who has served Long Beach City College for 25 years and who is retiring as a financial aid advisor here at Long Beach City College. Uh, so for all of her years of service and for supporting so many of our students and always smiling throughout the rush of students at the beginning of every semester, uh, thank you, Dorothy, for many wonderful years and congratulations. Thank you very much. Actually, I've been doing this for 37 years, so um, this will be my first summer off. <laughs> I haven't had a summer off since I was 20, so I'm actually going to be enjoying the beach and reading, but I've enjoyed my years here at Long Beach City College. It's always a challenge working with students and faculty and staff, but I've enjoyed every moment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next. Uh, uh, this in individual has served the college for 19 years and has been um, uh, really the heart of the uh, academic senate. Uh, she has kept the trains rolling, uh, kept that organization moving forward, ensured that uh, everything is done to maintain the highest academic quality possible for Long Beach City College and has done it always with a smile. Um, we certainly share something in common that uh, we both have survived many academic senate presidents, but uh, uh, Linda Lauer, thank you for your service. Thank you for being such a great asset to Long Beach City College and all of your years of service. So please join me in congratulating Linda Lauer. And uh, last but certainly not least, and I don't think uh, sh she's here, uh, Sandra uh, Backen, uh, instructional assistant. Uh, Sandra here? Okay, she's not here. So Sandra has served the college for 16 years as an instructional assistant. She's always also been a senior office assistant uh, and an instructional aide. So we want to thank her for her service um, and for supporting Long Beach City College for 16 great years. So please join me in congratulating Sandra on her retirement. <laughs> and that's all I have. And uh, congratulations to all the retirees. Thank you for your service to Long Beach City College. I think it shows that the uh, commitment and the time that you put in here uh, shows in many of the successes that we share with our students as they move on to their careers. So thank you for yours. Um, approval of the minutes of June 11, 2013. Can I have a motion, please? I have a motion. Do I need a second? I have a second, okay. No changes to the minutes, so the minutes will be adopted as, as provided. That's, oh, uh, sorry. Uh, student Trustee uh, Donado. Yes. Um, I just have a question uh, in the minutes. I, I notice that the, the discussion that okay, okay, I yeah, that I presented uh, last board meeting uh, under the approval of the minutes are not reflected. So I just want to know if usually this board um, states in the minutes the discussions that we have under any item that we are approving. I 
I, I think what the student trustee is asking is if we reflect all of the discussion in the minutes and um, the board uh, minutes are action minutes, they're not uh, verbatim minutes. So I think that, that's the question. Yeah. Student uh, trustee is asking. yeah, we will continue with that. Um, so the minutes will reflect the discussions on the items? The minutes will reflect action items. In other words, when there is an action item, we will reflect those items. We are not, we do not reflect minutes on a word by word, uh, item by item basis. Uh, they are action minutes that are condensed for purposes of saving trees. If an individual is um, interested in looking at the full item and the full discussion, uh, they could certainly visit the website at the Long Beach City College LB, at the Long Beach edu. Uh, it's on uh, the um, you, YouTube? Yeah, YouTube. Yeah, YouTube section. So, I mean, th it's certainly available through there. All right, thank you. It, we will continue to reflect those minutes as, as they are. This is an item, this is a, a, a discussion that we had many years ago where we had minutes that were very thick and the board at that time decided to be a little bit more um, efficient and just reflect the minutes that have action items on it. Well, and uh, if I can just interject, it, it also coincided with the board broadcasting yes, the uh, exactly. board meetings and recording them. Right. That's exactly right. Um, ordering the agenda, I'm going to be pulling item 12.5 for discussion. Excuse me, Mr. President. I think we, we still didn't vote to approve the. I'm sorry. We had a motion and a second, but we had a motion second, question, so we, didn't, we never voted on it. You, you don't have to take a vote on it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, before I move any further, uh, I just want to say that uh, this morning we lost uh, an icon. Uh, for Long Beach City College and for the la la Latino community, particularly in the person of uh, Ray Rodriguez. Uh, Ray was a former dean and instructor here at Long Beach City College, and uh, he was certainly uh, an individual that uh, cared very deeply about his community, about Long Beach City, and uh, we uh, will be ending today's meeting in his memory. Uh, more to come uh, about his life in the, at the end. Um, report of the Board of Trustees, uh, any committee reports? Hearing none, we move on. Student trustee. Good afternoon. Um, I would like to start by thanking President Oakley for the information he has gave me. It has been really useful, so thank you. Um, last board meeting, I express my opposition to Assembly Bill 955, which, which passed the, um, said the Senate Education Committee. As a student representative in the Board of Trustees, it is my responsibility to represent the best interest for all LBCC students. And that is why I am strongly opposing to this bill. For those of you who doesn't know about it, AB 955, after amendment, amended, proposes a pilot program that basically is going to create more summer and winter intercession courses, but the students will have to pay the total cost for the course, which is $200 per unit or more. I recognize the good intentions of President Oakley, who has been vocally supportive um, of AB 955. I and I recognize the good intention of the bill of giving more possibilities of enrollment. But at Long Beach City College, where the majority of our students receive financial aid, which means that they are much probably under the poverty line, I cannot see how um, a student under these conditions can possibly afford paying this high cost of tuition. This bill will discriminate the majority of our students who cannot afford paying this cost and will create a system really similar to a private institution, I believe. That is not, uh, I believe actually, that is not the mission of a community college. I believe all students should have equal educational opportunity. A few days ago, 
Los Angeles Times posts an article which states that after Proposition 30 passed, some colleges have increased in more than 500% the number of summer classes offered. Why? While this is happening in other colleges and after we went to a process of program discontinuance, the number of summer courses uh, offered keep decreasing. And why uh, the tentative budget 213, 214 it states that there will be budget redi redirections and potential reductions. I have with me uh, Lumina Foundation strategic plan. Lumina Foundation is a private organization that has been granted the district with generous amount of money and I am really grateful for that but I don't want to think that by receiving this general generous grant, we are supporting their strategic plan, which has as one of their final goals, and I am quoting, um, design new higher education, business and financial model. If that were the case, I believe that the students and the community should know about it and should be part of the decision making process. Personally, I believe that education is a right for all, not a business. Last board meeting, um, a community member brought to our, to our attention a property owned by the district, which has been unused for about 10 years. I propose whether use that property for accommodations for our students or sell it and use the money to reinstate the programs that were discontinued. I believe we could give a better use, we could use better our taxpayers' money. I would like to end my report by wishing the best to all the students who are, are enrolled in summer classes and reminding this administration to honor the First Amendment to the United States of America of freedom of speech for all of our students. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Andrea. Uh, we are now at the point of uh, public comments and agenda items. I did not receive any speaker cards in that, so we will move on with the agenda. Uh, the consent agenda, we've already noted that we're going to be pulling item 12.5. Can I have a motion on the other items? So moved. I have a motion. Second. Can I have a second? Okay, I have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any discussion? The other way around. Any discussion? Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, motion passes. Okay, item 12.5. Andrea, this was the item you wanted to pull. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, the reason of why I have decided to take this of the consent I, uh, agenda is because um, I want some clarification. Um, I, I know we have been discussing about the minutes and uh, if the only thing that is going to be like, we are gonna keep are the videos, I, I believe and I practically know that we cannot save everything for uh, for life but at least the videos of the board meeting should be always online and able for all community members that at some point want to see them so that's the reason i want just some clarification of if we are even destroying them or what is actually the records that we are destroying Okay, I'm gonna refer this to staff, and I think uh, the keeper of our records uh, would be uh, Jackie, or you want- well, we, have <coughs> we have uh, uh, board policy and regulation over the destruction of, of records. If the question is, um, well, first of all, we don't destroy um, board minutes. Those are kept in perpetuity. Um, so the destruction of records refers to um, paper documents um, and other electronic media. And I'd ask uh, Vice President Gable to give an example of what kind of documents uh, are uh, part of the regulation um, 
of uh, destruction of records. Yes, thank you. Um, actually, this destruction of records is specifically related to the records maintained within administrative services, and so it's uh, checks, invoices, purchase orders, contracts, bidding documents, cash receipts, bank statements, all those types of things that fall under class three as disposable records after the uh, five-year period. So this is something that we do annually to uh, clean out all of our filing cabinets because we can't keep everything and it is perfectly acceptable within uh, education code to do so. Any other comments? <coughs> Andrea. And yes, sorry. Um, I just want to be sure that the videos that are online stay online. Well, th those videos are not part of this agenda item. I um, mean, we can, th the board can discuss how long the videos are up, uh, but uh, we're not required by Ed Code to keep them up. Uh, we keep them up for, as they're posted for, uh, for quite a bit of time for the viewing public. Also, they're broadcast on the uh, local uh, cable channel. Uh, uh, but those are not, this agenda item does not pertain to those recordings. Okay. Um, can I have a motion on this item, please? Move approval. Can I have a motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any, any uh, nays, abstentions? Motion passes. Thank you. I mean, a rough time here today. Uh, end of the consent calendar, uh, item 5.3, indefinite salary rates for district employees is an action item. Can I have a motion, please? Move approval. Can I have a move and a, a motion and second? Discussion. Any discussion on this item? Okay. Hearing none, we'll have the vote. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. Thank you. Item 8.1, additional courses to general education plan for kine kinesiology and athletics. This is an action item. Can I have a motion, Move please? Move approval. Can I have a motion and a second? Discussion. No discussion on this item. A vote. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, motion passes. We're now on item 9.1, Superintendent President's report. Mr. Oakley. Thank you, uh, Board President Uranga. Uh, I just have a few items to update the board on. Um, uh, first of all, let me just uh, clarify something that uh, the student trustee brought up with regard to the property that we own. Uh, this is the Los Coyotes property that we purchased I think sometime in 2003 or so. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, again, I, I, I welcome the student trustee to bring any of those questions to myself or, or any of the vice presidents to seek clarification on. Um, that property, first of all, is, is not vacant. There are two um, medical facilities there, uh, two buildings that are um, leased to um, several uh, uh, dental offices, uh, other medical providers, um, that we retain the lease revenue and use it to provide student support services. During uh, the last several years, uh, we earned about $500,000 a year that we were able to put back into the general fund to support uh, classes and other student support services. So that was revenue that went right back into the college. Um, the property was purchased with uh, certificates of participation that were financed uh, through facilities. If we sold the property, we could not use that, those funds to put back into the general fund. They would have to go back to paying um, that, uh, that financing, so we could not. It would have to be, go back into facilities. So by law, we could not use that money if we sold it to provide additional classes or to bring back any programs. Um, so I'm happy to sit down with you and discuss that. Also, you're welcome to sit down with Vice President Gable who can give you all the details on that, on that property and how that works. A um, Couple of other items. Uh, first of all, let me, um, uh, uh, let me first of all, uh, thank uh, Dr. Gaither Lowenstein, who um, has decided to, to resign from the district 
for his service to Long Beach City College. Dr. Lowenstein um, uh, guided the Office of Academic Affairs for about a year and a half, um, worked with the faculty leadership um, on a number of issues um, and served the district admirably. So we wish him well in his new endeavor and, um, and uh, wish him the best of luck. Uh, to replace uh, Dr. Lowenstein, the district will uh, open up a recruitment for a vice president of academic affairs beginning this fall. Uh, in the meantime, though, we are uh, um, happy to report that Dr. Marilyn Brock has agreed to serve as the vice president of academic affairs until we fill the position permanently. Uh, Dr. Brock, as uh, many know, served as the vice president of academic affairs here at uh, Long Beach City College for a number of years. Um, she has agreed to come back and serve in that role as well as uh, take on responsibilities of the Dean of Career Technical Education as well. So she will be helping uh, uh, faculty and staff in the CTE area. Uh, Dr. Brock is coming out of retirement so um, she can be with us until the position is filled. Uh, so we will welcome Dr. Brock at the next board meeting. She begins on July 1. Um, also, I'm going to pass out uh, an item that we just recently received from the uh, district attorney's office. Uh, I think I've got enough copies here for the board. As, uh, as many of you know, the... Um, the former student trustee, Jason Troya, who's here with us today and, and others have raised questions about alleged Brown action violations of the board uh, and most recently submitted a complaint um, to the district attorney's office, the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office. Um, even though our district council responded to the um, allegations, um, uh, they were submitted, uh, the complaint was submitted to the district attorney's office. District attorney's office has recently responded and um, has uh, concluded that uh, there were no Brown Act violations, that uh, the allegations made um, were not substantiate, substantiated. Uh, they also made clear that the president's leadership council and the academic council of the long Long Beach, of Long Beach City College are not subject to the Brown Act. So um, I wanted to bring that to the board's attention. You have the full report there. I will give a copy to the board secretary should any members of the public want to view it. Um, let me also um, ask uh, Vice President Peterson to give the board a quick update on summer session, and in particular, those courses that are related to the summer teach out for the programs that were discontinued. Uh, I know the board has uh, had some interest in hearing where we're at with that summer uh, session. So um, later in the year, we will get a full report, but I wanted uh, Dr. Peterson to give the board an update on what classes we were offering and what those enrollments look like. So, Dr. Peterson? What you're seeing in the, in the handout coming right now are the, um, the courses that are being offered this summer. So on the front page, as you see that, are the courses that started June 10th um, in our summer session. Um, and you'll see the enrollment capacity and then the number of students enrolled. Uh, our, our goal was to offer these courses uh, with at least five students in them, um, and then we committed as we went through the process to offer them uh, for any of the students that came forward in that group that could complete with the two units and the, uh, the two classes in these courses. So you'll see that in um, that we have uh, significant numbers in courses in auto body, in um, air conditioning, um, automotive technology, um, aviation maintenance, and carpentry, um, uh, okay numbers in diesel, and then uh, welding is our lowest enrolled of the programs in the summer. On the back, you'll see the uh, teach out courses that began this week that are in the second, uh, second phase of the summer session. Um, 
we have interior design and the audio production here. What's not listed is the photography. Uh, we are still working on that. Uh, we will pull that information and bring it to you the next board meeting so you can see that. Thank you. And these were the courses directly tied to the summer teach out. Um, we did and have offered um, other summer school courses that are not directly related. Um, uh, Vice President Gable, do you recall how many more sections we offered this summer uh, relative to last summer? I have it in FTES, and then I can do a quick calculation. Sure. But last summer, uh, we generated about 750 FTES, and this summer, we're projecting to generate about 1,187. Um, so we're you know, just, just under 500 more in FTES that we're offering. Um, so, so that's a little bit over a 40% increase. Yes. Okay. I think that's a good enough number. Okay, any questions from the board about the summer teach out? Just a couple. Um, so I, I noticed, for example, in uh, Auto Body 419, we've got an enrollment capacity of 15, but we've got four, uh, 47 students who say they want to take the class. How does that work? Um, is everybody going to be accommodated? And uh, if so, how? Just Th those are the stu total students enrolled, so they are actually enrolled in taking that class, correct? correct. So we open up new sections or we, uh, we enroll more people, we, we lift the, the limits or what? Uh, correct. So these are the, the current enrollments. So we accommodate all these students and they've been w in these courses since, on this front page since June 10th. Okay. And f so if, and, f and basically in all these teach out classes, are we accommodating everybody that wants to be taught out? Uh, as long as they meet the requirements of the course, yes. So if they, if they do not meet a prerequisite of the course, then uh, we did not waive the prerequisite. Okay. Okay, thanks. Let me, uh, Dr. Clark. With regards to that, uh, you have a capacity, that, that same, there we go. Uh, item number three, you have capacity of 15 and you have 47. Do we add, do we add sections? What, what tends to happen is if we are able to accommodate all those students in one class, it depends on the faculty member, whether it depends on the class capacity, the room capacity, uh, we either accommodate that number of students or we may add a, another section. But at the present time, the, they are being accommodated yes. in that one all section. Th those numbers are yeah. total students enrolled, so they're, in they're that being section. accommodated. Okay. Yes. okay. Makes sense. Any other questions on the teach out? Okay. Uh, one last item. Uh, uh, I just uh, received um, the uh, latest copy of the American Association of Community Colleges Community College Journal. It's a national publication that goes out to all 1,200 plus uh, community colleges, public community colleges in the nation. And we were featured um, in the magazine with regard to uh, uh, the Long Beach College Promise, uh, the changes we've made uh, with regard to the Promise Pathway Initiative. So I wanted the board to have a copy of this uh, given the, um, the reports that we've had recently and uh, I wanna make sure that you know that uh, we were featured uh, nationally on the work that uh, the board has been championing. So with that, that ends my report. Thank you, uh, Mr. Oakley. Uh, next agenda item is uh, academic affairs. No items, no report. Student services, no items, no report. Administrative services, uh, act, uh, item number 12.7, approval of the tentative budget for 2013 and 14 components of fund balances and action item. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. We have a motion and a second discussion. Uh, Vice President Gable. Yes, thank you. Um, so I have a PowerPoint presentation tonight to summarize the tentative budget primarily as it relates to the unrestricted journal fund. And um, I'll give you a little bit of an overview on the state budget, where we are with our goals, our assumptions, 
um, our FTES history and then going through all of the various um, fiscal information for the unrestricted general fund and some of the steps that we've been taken. So as far as the state budget overview goes, uh, just a reminder that is very important is our tentative budget is built upon the January governor's budget. We do not revise the tentative budget um, based upon what comes out with the governor's may revise or what was just uh, passed by the conference committee on June 16th since the governor hasn't signed it yet. So any of those changes that came after the January governor's budget will be reflected within our adopted budget um, at that point in time when we bring that to you back in September. So when we were building our budget, uh, just a little bit of a reminder, the January governor's budget had projected additional funding for community colleges of about $197 million on a statewide basis. That was about a 3.6% increase in revenue. And so what we did um, within the budget advisory committee and the assumptions that we uh, created for the tentative budget was that we were going to assume that that entire amount was provided for restoration and that it was not split between uh, COLA, categorical, backfill, or restoration, but that it was all going on restoration. So you'll see in our budget that uh, we provided about $3.4 million um, in restoration that allows um, an additional 647 funded FTES for the college. There is a zero COLA. Um, Student fees are remaining at the $46 per unit. There was no restoration of the categorical program cuts that were imposed back in 910, um, and they were decreasing the amount of the cash deferrals by 179 million, um, so that on a statewide basis, the total deferrals are down to 622 million. Um, we had a high of 961 million, now it's down to 622 million which for us uh, means that the state is keeping about $11.5 million of our funding that we won't receive until um, July and October of 2014. The redevelopment agency elimination language continues, um, and there was a hold harmless related to property tax shortages, although we haven't seen that really come to fruition yet, even though the language is there. So moving to the other aspect of how we build our budget assumptions, um, first we use the January governor's budget, then we look at our board goals and how we tie our funding in based upon the board goals. So you see there that our number one board goal is to support the student success agenda and there's three components of that to implement the educational master plan implement the Promise Pathways program, and expand the Long Beach City College Promise. So we have done that both in the 12-13 year, and here are some of the accomplishments that we made in 12-13, um, whereby we piloted uh, different methods of placement for our first-time students, uh, both our English and math courses. We're gonna continue doing that in our 13-14 year, with a little bit of tweaking based upon experience of the first go round. And um, we're trying to uh, install and implement enrollment management strategies. We have started with a student-centered scheduling system that's going into effect for the 13-14 year. And we're trying to leverage our technology as much as we can um, in support and, and then provide equitable student access. Um, at the PCC campus as well as here at LAC. As far as the Promise Pathways program goes, we are adding both Paramount and Bellflower uh, Unified School Districts to the program this upcoming fall of 13. And we have increased both our math and English sections that we're offering. Um, and we also added a math workshop uh, this summer that's working with Long Beach Unified School District um, for that math workshop. The expanding the Long Beach City College Promise, um, as the board knows, this is really funded directly by our foundation and the scholarships. Um, this past year, the foundation awarded 504 scholarships uh, to our freshmen incoming from the Long Beach high schools, um, and they plan on um, 
awarding however many come this fall, they will be awarding to them as well. The second board goal is supporting the career technical education, workforce development, and economic development agendas uh, to strengthen the regional economy. And one of the ways that we're doing this is implementing and expanding the programs to serve the small business development. So we have opened a, a uh, SBDC satellite office in San Gabriel, and there's a specialty technology center at the LA Chamber of Commerce um, that is being funded with our small business development grant. We have also implemented and continue to implement the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses Initiative. We are in our third year of this program. Uh, we've completed or will complete eight cohorts as of August 2013, and we'll have classes beginning for cohorts nine and 10 in the fall of 2013. Uh, they are organizing a local economic development summit, and they're hoping that that forum will take place in fall of 2013. And then lastly, our third board goal is to allocate resources in a manner that prioritizes these board goals. So taking those two um, items, and then taking the institutional priority that is developed by the College Planning Committee, uh, we build the assumptions um, at the Budget Advisory Committee. So the institutional priority that our College Planning Committee came up with uh, this year is to improve rates of student success, um, which is a very broad category, but I think we are uh, making inroads into trying to do that. And then some of the assumptions that the Budget Advisory Committee came up with was to minimize the deficit spending, that we would only have carryover for our technology master plan. Again, a zero COLA is budgeted in, at the tentative budget. That will change at adopted budget, but for right now it's zero percent. We had 647 FTES in restoration whereby our target FTES for the entire year was 20,400. And I say that this will likely change because at the adopted budget, now that we know what the statewide budget's going to be, that funding has been split between both COLA and restoration. So our amount of funded FTES will likely come down from what we've put into the, this budget. So at this point in time, um, I'm estimating that when we get to our adopted budget, our target FTES could be 20,100 rather than the 20,400, and the difference is really made up in the COLA revenue uh, that we'll be receiving. Additional um, assumptions that the Budget Advisory Committee came up with is that we will um, apply a 1% deficit factor to our apportionment. As we all know, this has uh, been extremely low from what has been imposed upon us in this 12-13 year, but we're hoping that in 13-14 we'll get back to more normal somewhat with a 1% deficit factor. And just as a reminder, what is a deficit factor? The deficit factor is um, something that is imposed by the state chancellor's office when at the statewide level, either the property taxes or in the enrollment fees don't come in at the amount that the state has budgeted for it. So rather than making up the, the difference of the loss in property taxes and enrollment fees with state apportionment, which is what we would like them to do and what they do for K-12s, but they don't do that for community colleges, they instead apply a deficit factor. So um, we have built in a 1% deficit factor into our tentative budget. Um, we also have discussed the concept of total cost of ownership and we're starting to move towards that um, where we say that principles shall be employed in department planning and budgeting processes. So we're hoping that when our departments start doing their program plans for this coming year during 13-14 that they will be looking at the total cost of ownership and building that into their department plans so that we can then um, put that into the budget process starting really in 14-15. We have that we're going to maintain a 5.5%. Excuse me, can, yes. can you explain the total cost of ownership because I think that... Yes, total cost of ownership is 
basically where when you um, purchase a piece of equipment, you it's not just the purchasing of the equipment, you know that you need to maintain that equipment. So there may be a maintenance agreement that goes on along with that equipment over a five year period. Well, when you put in that you wanna purchase that piece of equipment, you have that first outlay of um, cash to purchase it. And then five years down the line, you have an additional maintenance agreement that comes with it. So you need to make sure that you're accounting for and budgeting that additional maintenance agreement rather than just purchasing that piece of equipment. That's a simple one. Probably the, the bigger issue with total cost of ownership is as we're building new buildings, we need to make sure that we're staffing them appropriately um, with custodians, with our uh, media tech support employees so that the buildings can function and run appropriately that we're adding budget in for the supplies for that building, the toilet paper, the seat covers and the restrooms, all the cleaning supplies, everything like that. That's really what total cost of ownership is, is that we're taking that all into account as we have new buildings coming online and augmenting the budgets um, accordingly. Is this required by accreditation or uh, auditing or I mean, in, in the way community colleges are governed or? It's not required by auditing standards. However, the accreditation standards uh, do look at and um, ask questions on whether or not you are building into your budget total cost of ownership. And if you are not, um, then it's very likely that you will get a recommendation to do so in the future. And actually with our last accreditation visit, we had a similar um, I would say finding in the fact that we weren't doing this related to our technology needs. And so you'll see later in this budget where we have put forward a million dollars to get our technology systems um, back up current and then we'll be discussing in 1415 what that ongoing need would be for technology to keep everything current. So it is an accreditation finding that we've had on technology. Um, and if we didn't do it with our buildings, we would have the same finding as well. Okay. Um, again, our benefit costs, they did increase by 3.5%, um, which was approximately $500,000 for the 13-14 year. Our SUI, which is state unemployment insurance, actually decreased by 1.05%. Um, we have the item in here that our part-time hourly budget will contain sufficient dollars to meet the FTS target in accordance with the class schedules. And basically what that means is we have built the class schedules for summer, fall, and spring so that we'll generate 20,400 FTES and we have funded that completely um, for what the needs are to generate those FTES. So that's what that uh, line item is saying. That, that I think it's remarkable if we only pay one 3.5% for health benefits. Because they're going up considerably more than that in the marketplace. So I think that's a pretty good deal. Yeah, I think our, our 3.5% uh, increase was lower than we had anticipated. I think originally when it came out, it was over 10%, and our broker was able to negotiate that down. Uh, we do have a very good experience uh, factor, which helped, um, but it, it can fluctuate significantly year to year. And we did have an increase. Part of this increase is related to the Affordable Care Act uh, components and guidelines that went into effect for this upcoming fiscal year that we're already seeing uh, increases related to. And there will be more next year. And, and the, the FTES that we're adding um, how many FTES are we w able to add for next year and what does that compare to where we were a couple years ago? So when we built our adopted budget for the 12-13 um, fiscal year, we targeted 19,500. You'll see here directly on my next slide that um, on the column, the second from the, I guess the last, next to the last one if you're going from right to left, um, where it says 12-13 at the bottom. At P2 reporting, which was April 20th, is what we call our P2 reporting. On April 20th, uh, we estimated that we were gonna generate 19,853 FTES. 
we built into the budget and targeted 19,500. And you see that we have generated more than what we're gonna be paid for. We have about 300 unfunded FTES uh, in the 12-13 fiscal year. And um, we are budgeting, as I said, 20,400. So that's a total of about 547 additional FTES that we've built into the budget for the 13-14 year or about a 2.8% increase. So more students, more classes, and uh, we're able to do that with the monies that are now being, that the state's generating and that they've said that they're gonna pay us. Yes, we have more students, more classes. We, we also, as you see, we are budgeting to have unfunded FTES, and that's something that we do um, pretty much every year. We try to budget about a 1% over what we think we're gonna be funded for just to allow us some flexibility in the course offerings that we um, do put on the class schedules. Uh, let me just point out one thing. I think it's an, always important to go back, particularly to the 0708 year, which is the year that we began to decline and uh, just recall that uh, although we continue to add classes, we are significantly behind the capacity that we were able to to have in 2007-8. So we, we need to continue to work with the state, with uh, the legislature, to bring us back to at least the levels we were in 2007-2008, because uh, we're still significantly behind where we were at that period of time. Um, so you can see we not only lost in terms of where we were in 07-08, but we've had increased demand since 0708, so we have continued to turn away um, many, many students that um, that we need to serve. Yeah, and, and because I think it's a difficult concept to understand, because the state uses all these funny words about how they give us money, could you just say a little bit more about restoration and why it is that they give us this money, but they're not really giving us new money, they're giving us old money that they owed us and that they're not nearly giving us the money that they owe us or giving us a small percentage of that, as I understand it. Right, so the reason we say restoration rather than growth is because until we get back to the level that we were at in 07, 08, when the cuts began, um, what we're saying is that the state is just restoring us to where we once were. And so once we get past 21,499 funded FTES, then we will start to be in a growth period. Until that point in time, we're just in restoration. Um, and even though we do have growth money coming forward, we do still have unfunded FTES. So the state still does not pay every district every dollar that they would be owed for all of the students that we serve. So I would say, um, especially in the, our large local urban areas, many of the colleges have unfunded FTES. I think it's the, the smaller uh, colleges in Northern California that are having a hard time even meeting their, their funded FTES due to the decline in students that they've had. But you see that we have been on a roller coaster ride um, in 910. You know, we had an exceptionally high amount of unfunded FTES. You see there we had 705. That was uh, really when the state cut us mid-year. So that was the first time that we had our mid-year cuts was in the 9-10 fiscal year. In 10-11, they told us that they were gonna cut us, but then really mid-year in January of 11, they provided growth funding. So we scrambled to add classes back in spring of 11 so that we would capture the growth funding, and we did when they just turned around in July of 11 and cut us substantially. So we have really been on a roller coaster ride um, these past five, six years, and we're hoping that 14, 15, we'll, we'll start to see it um, flatten out or start to improve and remain more stable than what we've been experiencing these past few years. Did that answer your question? Yes. Um, yes, uh, I just have a question. Um, if there's more students, there's more money, and all the programs we discontinued, they had a lot of uh, students that we discontinued as well, so that's mean that we are losing all the money that we were getting for those uh, students? 
Well, what we've done is redirected those FTES into other sections and course offerings. So we are still generating more funded FTES. We're going from the 12-13 year to where we're being funded at 19,553 to a planned funding level. Again, this is our tone to budget. This is gonna change and adopted. Um, but right now in this budget, we're planning that we'll be funded for 20,200. So that's taking into account the programs that have been discontinued, um, but those FTES and those courses have been shifted to other disciplines and other programs so that we are still actually um, serving more students than we did in 12-13. And, and I assume that um, we, we also are experiencing more demand, that we're given the numbers of people on our wait lists, especially for our 10 most popular classes and indeed for all of the classes, the numbers are very high. And so even though we say, hey, we're go look at this trend line, we're going in 11, 12 from the nadir of this, this trend where we had 19,332 FTS um, that were funded and 362 that were unfunded and we're going up. Uh, we're, in addition to that, we're experiencing a lot of demand because of the economy and uh, what's going on in the world. and. Uh, uh, and so even if, if we could fund everybody that wanted to go to school here, all the FTEs, I, th I think it would be substantially more than 21.5 uh, just because that's what, uh, what the community is, is saying. We want to go to Long Beach City College. We want to get these skills. We want to get these classes. We want to improve ourselves. Is, is that fair? I would say that's a fair statement. Okay, so now we'll move on. Um, just on this slide, we're showing you all of our funds. We have a total of 10 funds. And um, just as a reminder, we are required by the Budget and Accounting Manual to account for the revenue that comes in um, within different funds. When we talk about the budget for Long Beach City College, we're really focused on that first line, the unrestricted general fund. So that's really our operating money that we have. Um, for our expenses, and that's the fund that all of our FTES revenue comes in and expenses go out of. So um, what we show here is where we were, the adopted budget for 12-13, where we think we're going to end the year, June 30th of 2013, that's the estimated actual column, and then the tentative budget for 13-14. Um, so you see that our expenditures are going up in our unrestricted general fund by a couple million dollars. Um, and we'll go through the details of that in a minute. And then the rest of our funds, our restricted general fund, that's what's used for all of our grants and our categorical programs. Our capital projects fund, you see that that is trending down and that's because um, we need another statewide bond to pass before we'll get any more state funding for building. So um, we're hoping that there will be one in November of 14, because if so, we think that our buildings M and N here on this campus will finally be able to move forward with that project, as well as the MM building at the PCC campus if there is a statewide um, bond election that is approved in November of 14. We have our child and adult development fund. So this is where all of the, the two child care centers at LAC and PCC, the funds for that run through. Our contract community education fund um, is where we do just that. Um, basically, uh, Luann's uh, group there runs our contract education. The funding goes through there. Our general obligation bond fund, um, we have spent that down considerably. Uh, from where we were, we're averaging anywhere from 30 to $35 million a year. The 223.6 million, that reflects what's remaining on our total authorization from our Measure E 2008. So of the 440 million, uh, we still have uh, just under 224 million to spend. So if we keep on this track of 30 to 35 million, we'll finally be done with our bond projects in about six years. Um, and then our retiree benefits fund, that's where we pay all of our retiree health and medical premiums, as well as put in our money for the future obligation related to our retiree benefits. Our self-insurance fund is for our property and liability insurance. The student financial aid fund, this is where all of the student grants 
run through. So 50 million of that 64.2 million is uh, Pell Grants, and then the rest are our SEOG grants, our EOPS grants, our CARE grants, our uh, direct loans, those types of things. And then lastly, we have our veteran stadium operation, which is all of the rental activities and movie shoots and everything that we do out of the stadium as well as the uh, swap meets. So overall, we are just over $416 million uh, operation in our tentative budget for 1314. So now moving into um, what went into building our tentative budget, as we all know, uh, we did go through some expenditure reductions, which totaled 3.1 million, and this is a reduction from what was in our 12-13 budget. So our program discontinuance um, accounts for $2.2 million of that reduction, and then we had some reorganization savings excuse me, of about $300,000. Um, and you see there that we have uh, reduced really all three of our major areas of employees. Our faculty has been reduced. Um, our management team has been reduced. And our classified team is actually being increased with the reorganization to where we're adding um, over 19 full-time equivalent employees. Um, uh, just recently we had added, um, or we were proposing to add five custodians as part of the total cost of ownership. We had a proposal come from our custodian staff to ask if we could reinstate some of those that had been reduced last year and hire fewer number of new custodians and we looked at it and it made sense. And so we are going to move forward with reinstating our 15 custodians that were uh, down to 10 months. We're gonna put them back up to 12 months and then we're gonna hire three new 10 month positions um, as part of this proposal um, for about the same amount that it would cost us to hire five new positions. So we are doing that. Um, so there's our expenditure savings there. Now moving into the unrestricted general fund. Here's the overall summary. Um, we're only showing the estimated actual. Again, this is what we're estimating. We're gonna end the year as of June 30th of 2013. And uh, the tentative budget for 1314, and then the change, the increase, or the decrease. So as you can see on the bottom line there, our fund balance, we are projecting a three point a uh, $154 million increase in our fund balance or surplus, and I'll go over the details of um, how we got there. Oops, there we go. So for our revenue summary, so on the previous page, um, it showed in total we're going from about $97.9 million in revenues to $105 million in revenues for an increase of $7 million. The majority of that is coming through apportionment. Um, this is where I mentioned that we budgeted for a 1% deficit factor in our apportionment. Um, however, at our um, P1, which was the apportionment that came from the state in March, they applied a 6.3% deficit factor to our 1213. Um, fiscal year allocation. So that difference between what we're budgeting the 1% and the 6.3% that they applied this current fiscal year, that's a $5 million increase in revenue for the 13-14 year. And we also mid-year received from about a million dollars in restoration um, that is in here. And as I mentioned, there's 1.9 million for the restoration for the 13-14 year. So overall, we're projecting about seven and a half million dollars more in apportionment if the deficit factor can be at 1% um, and not higher than that. As far as the other state, this increase of about uh, $64,000 
from the estimated actual to the tentative budget that's primarily related to our state lottery money. Since we've increased the amount of FTES that we're gonna be generating, our lottery that we receive is higher because we get paid on a per FTES basis. So that's primarily what that increase is related to. On the local revenue, um, this is things like our interest income, our parking citations, um, monies that we receive from cell tower rentals, that type of thing. And there is a decrease related to those three that I just mentioned. We had some cell towers that their contract just ended and they removed their cell towers because the companies merged. So we're losing about $45,000 um, in rental revenue due to that and our parking and citation revenues are down slightly. So that's why you see a decrease of about 208,000 in our local revenues. Our other sources are down, and that is really related to our Los Coyotes um, uh, property, the revenue that we see, receive from the lease revenue. There's some significant parking lot improvements that need to be made, and so that is paid directly from the lease um, revenue that we receive. So we'll be uh, getting a net amount of about $180,000 less that we're budgeting than what we received this year so that we can do those parking lot improvements over there. And that's what I just said. So moving on to the expenditure summary, again, we have our expenditures broken down into the major classifications in accordance with the budget and accounting manual. So the first line item there are our academic salaries, and you see that we are projecting it to decrease by about $1.6 million um, from where we were, and that's primarily related to the program discontinuance as well as we had a large number of retirements in our full-time faculty. So that is a net number with all the different changes, but that's, um, that represents a loss of about 19 full-time faculty from uh, what we had in 12-13 because we are planning to hire 17 faculty in the 13-14 year that is in this budget. Our classified salaries are increasing. Um, as I mentioned, with the uh, reorganization plan, we are adding over 19 full-time equivalent employees in the classified uh, staff level. Benefits are going down about 116,000. Uh, benefits are really a function of our salaries, and so since overall our salaries are decreasing, our benefits have decreased slightly. Our supplies are down about 221,000 from what we anticipate to spend this current fiscal year, and that's really related to the instructional supplies since uh, the lottery revenue is now covering um, the entire amount of our instructional supplies. We don't have it and need for it in the unrestricted general fund, so that's why that decreased there. Our services line item, you see, has increased substantially by $2 million. 1.75 million of this is put in for election costs. And our capital outlay line item has increased by just over a million dollars. And as I mentioned, this is a one-time million dollar allocation uh, for technology that was um, approved and recommended by the Budget Advisory Committee. And then our other outgo is increasing 175,000, 100,000 of that is for our property and liability insurance costs, and 75,000 is to support the uh, child, care, child care centers. Excuse me. So here is a pie chart that just kind of breaks down those major categories and shows you the percentage that we're spending on each. So if we add up all of our academic salaries, our classified salaries, and our benefits, uh, that represents 85.3% of our total budget is being spent on um, our uh, employees, basically. That number is lower than what we've seen in the past, and later on you'll see a slide with a seven-year history. That's going to be a one-time occurrence um, because we are going to need to add a significant amount of full-time faculty in the 14, 15 year that I'll discuss a little bit later on as well. So here is a breakdown of our reserves. As I mentioned, um, the tentative budget being presented has about a uh, $3.2 million surplus, which will bring our total reserves to 
$100,355. There is the board mandated reserve of 5.5%, so that's $5.6 million. And then we have the economic uncertainties at $7.6 million. And then we have some assigned reserves for the technology master plan of about 85,000. And then our vacation and load banking reserve is just under 2.8 million. So those are the different components of our um, ending fund balance. So here is the seven year trend sum summary that I was referring to just a minute ago. So that top line there shows where we've been um, on our salaries and benefits as a percentage of our total expenses and other outgo. And you see back in 07, 08, we were at 85.2%. It increased um, each year, although in 12, 13, we're estimating that it'll only be about 88%, and it's now down to 85.3 in this tentative budget. Our surplus or deficit, um, four of the seven years projected has a deficit. Um, so we did have three years there with a surplus. And then you see our ending fund balance as well as the percentage of our ending fund balance for each of the respective years shown. This graph is basically just um, a uh, line chart to show it a little bit different on where we've been with our surpluses and deficits. So anytime the blue line is higher than the red line, that's a year of surplus. And when the red line is above the blue line, that's a year that we're deficit spending. So again, just like with our FTES, um, our budget picture has been somewhat of a roller coaster the past few years. So moving into um, a two-year projection, and I think the importance of this is because we see that we have a surplus uh, there of $3,154,000, but that's really one-time monies. Uh, since we did lose a significant amount of our full-time faculty, we're going to have to add them back in our 14-15 year. So what we're trying to do um, and what we've discussed at length within the Budget Advisory Committee is that we really need to look at this as a two-year period and a two-year budget. Um, so knowing that we're going to have to add, we're estimating about 30 full-time faculty at this point in time in 14-15, as well as our other changes that we estimate will occur in 13-15 without any new revenue coming to us, and we won't know if we're going to have new revenue until January of 14, um, our surplus will be decreased to just under $1.6 million uh, in the 14-15 year. So it's not like what we're showing here at Tentative is ongoing money because we are going to have to spend it down in 14-15 to hire back the 30 uh, new full-time faculty. And this is kind uh, of... Vice President Gable, let me just clarify. We're not hiring back the faculty. We are hiring new faculty in relation to uh, hiring priorities needs of the college, just to clarify that. Correct. <laughs> so when I talk about the future budget challenges, and this is what I'm really referring to on the full-time faculty obligation number, we have a state compliance guideline that requires us to maintain a certain number of full-time faculty. And that um, compliance guideline has been frozen since fall of 2008. Um, however, we anticipate that in fall of 2014, it will be unfrozen. And um, in order for us to continue to comply with the state guidelines, we will need to um, hire 30 new full-time faculty that would start in the fall of 2014. And so that's the other reason we're really looking at this as a two-year budget and not just focusing on 13-14 without looking into the future. So that concludes my budget presentation. I'll just open it up for more questions if there are any. Trust, uh, trustee? Uh, um, Dr. Yes, I, oh, uh, Mark. Yeah, the, the thing I wanted to bring up about this, I, I, I know I'm not the only trustee that feels this way, is about the uh, board mandated reserve. It was a couple years ago when we were hitting really hard times that we uh, um, 
that we went away from the 5.5% as being the board mandated reserve and had gone down to five. And I don't recall our ever having authorized going back up to 5.5. And in light of all the cuts we've made, I, I, I just don't really agree with the going higher once again. And this, uh, I'm, I'm not gonna vote against this right now because it's just a tentative budget, but I would like to at this time clarify that I, I would like to hope that if we have consensus on this that we can um, um, direct staff to when we come back with the final budget, I think September is when we do that, that um, we go to 5% to, to and the additional 0.5, which is about a, another half a million dollars, what that comes to, that we put that back into um, uh, services for the students or preferably, um, yeah, I don't know, preferably into um, more course offerings. So that's just what I wanted to mention and I don't know if, if I don't, we have consensus I don't think, on I that. I don't think you're alone on that one. Uh, Dr. Clark. Yeah, I had, uh, I had raised this issue with Mr. Bow and he was aware that yeah. I had concerns in regards to this. That we have the reserve is required of 5% and we've had rationale I think over the different years, difficult years, and I don't fault staff on looking at somewhat adding to that reserve, but but I think that we have some issues regarding our students, they're having trouble getting classes, we're having waiting lists, and and I would I would make a motion where we have to wait till our next meeting to actually uh, implement this, that the one and a half of the res uh, unrestricted reserve be set aside for student support and or additional courses. And I would like to uh, feel that we have an emphasis, Mr. President, on additional courses because I think that's the main difficulty our students have been having is getting courses. Uh, uh, hold on, before you respond, there's a sure. motion on the floor. Can I get a second, please? Second. And I'd like to make that as a motion. I understand we have to wait till our next well, meeting. Let me, let me clarify. So a couple of things we need to clarify. First of all, uh, it is the board's policy to have a five and a half percent reserve. So that's that's the the reserve that we brought to the board. Um, um, the board has chosen the last several years to reduce the reserve from five and a half to five, and we can certainly do that again this year. So the first clarification is that you would just adopt the tentative budget, and that when we come back for the adopted budget, we will bring down the reserve to the five and a, to the five percent. And that we will, uh, based on uh, what I'm hearing from the board, we will set aside that additional half percent for student support services and for courses. Is that correct? We don't have to X on a motion, which is I understood we'd have well, to. Have a you don't have to take that motion here. You, we would bring it back at adopted budget, make that change, and then you could adopt Did it. Did you implement it? I don't care how we do yeah. it. Okay. Thank you. So that that's if that's the the if. The consensus of the board is to bring the reserve down to 5%. We can do that at adopted. I, I certainly support that. that. However, um, this is an action item, so we, just for clarification. You purposes. would adopt the current tentative budget. Okay. We would have to go back and redo it for, for the adopted budget by, and change the board reserve back down to 5%. So and we're approving the tentative budget, but when it comes back to us, it'll be the adopted budget. And that's when it comes back, assuming that uh, the governor signs the budget and we're good to go, we will come back and by September with the adopted budget, we will make the change that's been requested Great. of the board that's all I um, okay. so that we would have more clarification on what kind of courses or student support services we could put it into. Okay. okay. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Andrea. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, just by seeing what the reserves are showing, um, I, I totally thought that programs discontinuance were part of a budget problem that we had, but I just see an increase in our reserves, so I would like a little clarification on that. Well, I, I, I think um, Vice President Gable did a pretty good job of walking us through, but basically, uh, part of the uh, surplus that you see is, um, is a function of the union, faculty union and the academic senate requesting of the district not 
to comply with its full-time faculty obligation in the current fiscal year, the 13-14, or excuse me, the 12-13 fiscal year. We chose not to hire faculty, uh, even though we have a full-time faculty obligation. We, we were asked and we agreed that we would postpone those hires for one year. So full-time faculty obligation, uh, every district, every college district in the state has to maintain a certain number of full-time faculty. Um, and um, because of uh, retirements, we have had to hire back a number of full-time faculty. Uh, we chose to postpone those hires this year, so we have to make those hires in the next fiscal year as well as the hires that we are obligated to make because of the 13-14 budget. Uh, so that money has been held until those hires can be made. So what Vice President Gable mentioned is that fund balance, that surplus would come down to about $1.5 million, I think it was uh, Vice President Gable. So that would be the surplus in the budget, uh, assuming that the budget as it currently stands is maintained. So the, the program discontinuance and the budget reductions that have occurred have allowed us to get to a point where we can actually uh, not only r eliminate the deficit, but have a slight surplus. Uh, so, um, so the budget that you see is a result of all those actions being taken. Any uh, further discussion on this item? Okay, so we'll look forward to the, uh, excuse me, oh, Phyllis. The, the uh, surplus of $3.1 million is one-time money. Is that, can that be used to hire faculty? If it's carried over, if it's one-time money, how can it be used to hire faculty? Can you clarify that? Well, when I said it was one-time money, what I was referring to was that that same surplus isn't going to carry over into the 14-15 year. So that's what we were trying to um, show here. In 14-15, we've built in that we're going to hire the 30 full-time faculty members in the fall of 14, which would, um, along with some other uh, changes in salary and benefits, would bring that surplus down to about $1.6 um, did that, that answer your question? That $3.1 million could be used for instructional purposes, say equipment, that kind of one-time costs. In the current fiscal in, in year. In the current fiscal year, in this fiscal year, this yes. coming fiscal year. Yes, and some of it will be, um, as we discussed at the budget um, advisory committee meeting, this tentative budget is based upon the January government's, or January governor's budget. So we know that the conference committee, as an example, provided $30 million on a statewide basis for scheduled maintenance and instructional equipment uh, slash library material categorical funding. That funding will come to us, but there is a match required. And what we had recommended with the budget advisory committee is that we split that money 50-50 between scheduled maintenance and instructional equipment. So by doing that, we will need to budget the match um, in our adopted budget, which would reduce uh, this surplus somewhat because we don't have any match uh, for grants budgeted at this point in time in the TENDA budget. So it should come down uh, slightly when we get to the adopted budget. But, but the balance of that surplus is technically unassigned at this, at this point, right? As a Correct. I mean, I think one thing that needs to be pointed out is that um, we are bu budgeting in this tentative budget $1.3 million for uh, potential recall elections, and that money, too, could be spent for academic purposes if there were no recall elections. And uh, so that's an awful lot of money that you could do an awful lot of good with. Correct. Any other Questions or comments? Okay, hearing none, we have a motion and a second uh, of the vote. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none. Okay, we pass the tentative budget. 
Item 12.8 is a resolution for ca cash flow borrowing from the Los Angeles County Treasurer. This is an action item. Can I have a motion, please? Move approval. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, we'll vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Seeing none, motion passes. 12.9, resolution cash flow temporary interfund cash borrowing. This is also an action item. Can I have a motion, please? Move approval. Second. Any uh, discussion? Seeing none, take a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Any none, motion passes. Item 12.10, resolution, final project proposal, construction trades two at PCC. This is an action item. Can I have a motion, please? Move approval. A motion to approve in a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, I'll vote. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, motion passes. 12.11, resolution, final project proposal, language, arts, renovation at LAC. This is an action item. Move okay. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Seeing none, motion passes. Item 12.12, five-year construction plan for 2015, 2019. This is an action item. Can I have a uh, motion, please? Second. I have a motion and a second. Can I have any, one quick any question discussion? about this? Now, we're required to have a five-year plan, are we not? Yes. Each year, we're required to update our five-year plan and submit it to the chancellor's office. Okay. Tom. Okay. Any other comments on this item? Hearing none. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. Item 12.13, resolution, contractual agreements and amendments to agreements under 175, 175,000, I'm sorry. This is also an action item, can a motion please? Move approval. I have a motion to approve. Second. second. Any discussion on this item? Seeing none, we'll vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Seeing none, motion passes. Item 12.15, resolution disposal of property with collective value under $5,000. This is an action item. Can I have a motion, please? Move approval. Second. Yeah, motion and, and a second. Any discussion on this item? Is it 12? What, did I miss one? Oh, oh, well, let's go, I'll just go back. Uh, okay, 12.15. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, motion passes. Okay, go back to item 12.14, resolution change order authorization under 100,000. Action item, can I have a motion, please? Move second. Any motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. Item 12.16, resolution agreement with California Department of Education and general child care. This is an action item, can I have a motion please? So moved. Yes. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. Item 12.17, institutional memberships for 2013-14. This is an action item, can I have a motion please? I have a motion. Second. I have a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, take a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any abstentions? Uh, any nays? This way. Okay. Seeing none, hearing none, motion passes. Okay, item 14, Pacific Coast Campus. No items, no report. Item 15, College Advancement and Economic Development. No items, no report. Academic Senate, Phyllis. Yes, I'd just like to say that I look forward to representing the faculty and to working with the board and, and administration in meeting the needs of our students and the needs of this community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Phyllis, and welcome again to the board. Okay, trustee communications. This is an opportunity for the elected uh, trustees to have their comments? Trustees? No? Okay. 
move forward. You're a student trustee, you're on the agenda, you already spoke. Yeah. Okay, um, I will say it next. Okay, all right. I just wanted to comment uh, very briefly on the, the uh, letter we received from the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office. Um, uh, although I have some personal satisfaction in the validation of the position of the more majority of this governing board by the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office decision that we committed no illegal acts or violated the Brown Act in our decisions to discontinue several academic programs earlier this year. The process itself in which we had to endure, or which we endured, is still painful. And uh, I want to talk about that very briefly. Uh, what we had to endure was a process whereby a rogue trustee who steadfastly refused to participate in the process of this governing board by sharing his thought processes uh, with us and engaging in any kind of conversation and deliberation that defines how we handle these kinds of issues uh, and or that any other oversight governing board would tackle um, these kinds of issues over the last 16 months. Um, uh, there was just no participation. I'm especially disappointed that when we invited this trustee to provide us with the evidence of the immoral and illegal acts of which he accused us, that he never responded. Indeed, he chose not to attend the last three meetings of this body where these matters were discussed. I found that those decisions to not participate uh, and not provide the information that he said he had in abundance, uh, not only an abdication of his responsibilities to the students and to this body, but uh, also a, sort of a cowardly act because he made these accusations about individuals who he was supposedly worked with and then uh, didn't follow through with anything. Uh, at the same time, I'm sympathetic to what's going on generally in education right now, higher education in particular, and that is that we are we're living through a time where um, uh, we are no longer a land of opportunity. We're no longer a time when students can get their education, go on and be successes in their lives, and largely, that's been because of the policies in the past which made community colleges places of access, but not of success as well. And we at this community college have tried to change that by saying that given that education has become a scarce resource that has to be rationed, that it's not enough to just say, come on to Long Beach City College. We heard that in our budget report today. Uh, we hear it on a regular basis that we really need to get our students to not only come but to get through to create other places for other students. And, uh, uh, and I'm proud that we're moving in that direction. Um, the decisions that we've been making are hard decisions. And uh, I am not unsympathetic at all to the affected students and faculty uh, of the decisions that we've made. But I feel that um, over the 16 months that we considered these uh, decisions that we made, uh, appropriate decisions and that we are making a career technical education program at this college to be stronger and better than it has been and we have many many continuing career technical education programs so um, I, I wanted to say that because um, I think there's been a lot of misinformation about what's gone on with this board uh, that's been in many ways unchallenged uh, uh, hasn't been addressed directly and um, I think that, um, uh, that uh, now that the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office has said that there's absolutely no basis for the allegations of uh, immoral and, uh, and illegal actions, that I'm hoping that we can return to some semblance of normalcy and go back to serving our students. Thank you. <clears throat> Future reports, um, I didn't uh, hear anything tonight uh, for a future report. P uh, public comments and agenda items. Uh, I have two speaker cards here and I would remind the speakers that uh, please be respectful and collegial in your presentations as we are with you. I have uh, David Root and his discussion is on auto, auto body shop. You have five minutes.
Good evening. My name is David Root. I am the representative of the trades for Long Beach City College, and I come before you this evening to discuss an issue that is very disturbing to me. It has come to my attention that myself and my fellow auto body students, as well as my instructor's health, has been put in jeopardy. As far back as October of 2012, our downdraft spay boost filtration system has not been working properly. After numerous requests to the maintenance department by the instructors to address and correct this issue, it was only after some months, eight to be exact, and the phrase health and safety issue was this request taken seriously. After many hours of troubleshooting by the maintenance crew and some sheer dumb luck was it discovered that the gas service that is a vital part of the spray boost operation had been shut off and a city lock was installed. Many phone calls and countless I don't knows later was it discovered that it was in fact someone from Long Beach City College who had made the executive decision to discontinue the gas service to the auto body shop spray boost citing lack of use due to a letter that was received from Long Beach received at Long Beach City College stating that there had been a lapse in the use of the gas, never stating that it was in fact the meter at the spray booth. Never in this so-called executive decision did anybody bother to contact any instructor or the department head as to inquire why the usage of gas may vary from month to month. This act has not only placed myself and my fellow auto body students' health in danger, but also the instructors who were blindsided by this and not able to teach us to their full potential. I am especially disgusted at this blatantly harmful act due to the fact that I myself am a cancer survivor and many of the chemicals that I have been exposed to are some of the same chemicals that caused my cancer in the first place. Doesn't this go against the college's promise to provide all students with the highest quality of education possible and that our faculty and staff are dedicated to providing us with an excellent educational experience in a student-centered environment? I also know for a fact that at least one person sitting amongst you tonight also knows about this situation because the person who has admitted to being behind all this, Midhani Efren, has CC'd you in the emails concerning this very situation. I am putting all involved on notice that I am not going to just stand by and let this go. I am going to be the vo voice of all affected by this and by the death of our beloved programs in whatever direction it may take, whether it be media attention or legal recourse. Thank you. Uh, Michelle Garcia uh, on interior design discontinuance. My name is Michelle Garcia, I'm a student of the discontinued interior design program. I hope all of you were able to hear President Obama's speech today on climate change. Our president sees the urgency in change. We must invest in our future by embracing green economy. In order to do so, we must invest in a green education. A poignant part of President Obama's speech is when he said, sheltering future generations against the ravages of climate change must be a prerequisite when voting for our leaders. You are our leaders. And it's my duty as a mother and as a citizen to ask this of you. I urge you to invest in a sustainable future by investing in green education. I am still here advocating for green building education because the impact of buildings and construction are so significant. The impacts include 72% of electricity consumed, 40% of raw materials used, and 38% of carbon emissions. Our president is calling for action to reduce our carbon emissions. We need to educate our community, giving them the tools for employment and green jobs. I'm here to urge you to incorporate these green building principles into the curriculum here at Long Beach City College. I am here to present a proposal for a new curriculum incorporating interior design into the architecture department. A proposal that adds 11 of the interior design classes to architecture, creating an interior architecture program. There are several benefits of doing this. One, allowing the interior design students to complete their program here at Long Beach City College. Strength, uh, number two, strengthening the architecture department by adding over 250 interior design students. And building on the principles of green building, utilizing the knowledge and partnerships the interior design program has established. Some of the classes I am pushing for to be added are codes and specifications, digital illustration, 
lighting design for interior architecture, green design, lead classes, just to say a few. Also, these classes will directly coincide with Cal State Long Beach Interior Architecture Program. I urge you to take the initiative and invest in our future and to satisfy the students' investment in this college. Please approve and implement these new, this new program. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, that concludes the public comments on non-agenda items. We are near the end of our uh, meeting. I mentioned earlier that we had a very important member of our community pass away uh, this morning. And uh, I think I'll pass this over to Phyllis, who uh, knew him much more intimately, and a neighbor of hers. So go ahead, Phyllis. Put not know who Ray was. Um, Ray was a friend, uh, a longtime Latino community advocate. He was a pioneer for Latino faculty at LBCC and for Latino administrators at LBCC as well. Uh, he was a historian, an author of Decade of Betrayal, published in 1995. Here's his book. His book was an account of Mexican repatriation in the United States in the 1930s and its effect on both sides of the border. Ray was highly regarded in the Latino community in Long Beach and by his colleagues at LBCC, and he will be missed by many. Hold on a second. Uh, thank you, Phyllis. Uh, I also had the pleasure of meeting and uh, having many interesting conversations with, uh, with Raymond. He was uh, certainly very concerned about his community. Uh, back uh, when we were looking at uh, redistricting to increase the representation of, of uh, uh, members of minority communities on, on various boards, including the city council, this board, and the board of education, he was right out there with us. Um, he was a host of what we had established at that time, we called it the Concilio, which was a council, if you will, of uh, Latino organizations, and he was sort of the godfather of that organization by providing us with his wise counsel and advice uh, in directing how best to make change in the city of Long Beach. And uh, as one of the founding members of that, of that organization, um, he got to see some of that change. He certainly saw it there. He, see, he saw it with me uh, being elected on this board and, and uh, without his support and without his uh, advice and his, his uh, strength, uh, I certainly uh, want to thank Ray uh, for all the work that he did for us and, and effecting change in the city of Long Beach. I also got to hear a, um, uh, an interview that uh, uh, was in uh, uh, KPCC uh, where they interviewed him regarding his book. And uh, during that uh, interview, uh, he mentions the fact that back in the 1940s when uh, his father came to this country to start his career and start a family here. Uh, Raymond was born here, so he was a citizen, but his father was expatriated back to Mexico and he never saw his father again. He um, got very emotional <laughs> during that interview as I am here because I lost my father too, but not to expatriation, but I certainly know the feeling of a son missing his father. And Raymond, you're back with your dad. Um, Godspeed, and I close this meeting in his memory. Meeting adjourned. How about you yawn, man? Yeah, bottom line.